red-pilled humans of the matrix. I'm Dave Rubin, this is The Rubin Report, and we've got another Friday roundtable extravaganza for you. Joining me today is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute and author of the new book, When Race Trumps Merit, Heather McDonald, an essayist for Noble Truths with Rob Arora, Rob Arora. Heather, Rob, welcome to The Rubin Report. Fabulous to be with you, thanks, Dave. Yeah, I'm really, great to be here. I'm really glad to have you both on. I said to you right before we started that, you know, Heather, you've been, you've been cracking and hitting and smacking around DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and all of these uh, race stats and crime stats and all of these things for many, many years. And, and Rob is uh, sort of on deck now doing it right now. So I thought you guys would make a great duo today. And we have plenty of stuff in that department to get to. Uh, before we do that, I got one ad for you guys and then we'll get right to it. Uh, let's talk about Relief Band real quick. You know, is Joe Biden's economy making you nauseous? It's making me nauseous. Well, you've got to check out Relief Band. Relief Band is the number one FDA cleared anti-nausea wristband that's clinically proven to quickly relieve and effectively prevent nausea and vomiting associated with motion sickness, anxiety, migraines, hangovers, morning sickness, chemotherapy, and so much more. Whether you need everyday nausea relief or just an occasional cure from nausea, their patented technology makes feeling sick a thing of the past. It's like the name says, relief band, relief band is legitimately a band you wear on your wrist that gives you relief from nausea and you can change the intensity depending on how you're feeling to make it stronger or weaker. That means no more nausea pills that'll make you groggy and exhausted. Relief Band is 100% drug-free and non-drowsy, plus they've got an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau and over 100,000 satisfied customers, so they're a brand you can trust. So if you just wanna get those uh, accounts refilled, if you've ordered Red, uh, Relief Band before, go ahead and do that. You guys know that I like to polish off the week with a little tequila, and if I'm a bit nauseous the next day, it's rare, but it happens. I just throw on my Relief Band and the post hangover nausea is gone. Go to reliefband.com slash Ruben and you'll receive 20% off reliefband.com slash Ruben. All right, let's get to it. So uh, Heather, before we start here, I realized we have not spoke in quite some time. I haven't had you on since before COVID. You are in New York right now, so this wasn't really the point of today's show, but would you like to comment on what's going on in New York City before we get to it? Masks, people are still wearing masks outdoors. They're wearing masks in my apartment. They get on the elevator. They're still using their keys to press the elevator buttons. Now it's not as insane as it was before, but I despair, I really do. I, I am at this point fighting to hold my tongue, to not accost people on the street, asking them, what will it take to get you to turn off, take off your mask? We have uh, squalor everywhere. There's, there's uh, scaffolds erected around buildings because of a ridiculous law that requires building inspections of every brick on a, on a facade within for every five years, way over-regulated. We have these grotesque restaurant shanties that are covered with graffiti, uh, reflecting tape all over that nobody's gonna take down. So it's, a, it's really turned into a dystopian uh, urban environment at this point, in, in large part, but not exclusively, uh, because of the pandemic, just betrayal of decent risk conscious, rational policy during COVID, but also because of the issue of crime and the reluctance to enforce the law because it would have a disparate impact on minority criminals. Unfortunately, I don't think anyone listening is surprised by anything that you just said there. Uh, Rav, before we get into it, you are up in Vancouver in Canada. I know it's a little crazy in Canada these days. I'll give you the same opportunity. Anything you wanna just say about what's going on in Canada before we get to it? Yeah, well, the big thing here was the vaccine mandates that was preventing people from traveling and for a long time uh, going to restaurants, gyms, uh, large gatherings, weddings, and, and traveling that is, by the way, internationally and domestically on an airplane and train. So they got rid of that. Um, several months ago, so we're you know we're 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 back to where we were before, but th there are still some people who refuse to take off their mask and are at grocery stores and outside and university campuses. You can still find people who are engaging in this you know very risk averse behavior. But but I, I will say I 
my, my overall observation is that most people, even those that were fairly alarmed, irrationally alarmed about COVID, have now kind of just moved on because it's no longer um, a big issue anymore. They got vaccinated if they wanted to. Um, and now at this point, it's not really a big issue anymore. And uh, there's still a push by, you know, FDA, Pfizer, CDC, you know, the, the new bivalent boosters and just continuing push towards um, more and more medicalization. But I think most people now realize that, it, you know, it's over now. The you know, pandemic is over. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to get to what Pfizer is up to in just a second. I know we shouldn't be surprised by anything these days, but I'm continuously amazed when I get on planes now where they no longer force you to wear a mask simply because one 35 year old Trump appointed judge said no more masks on planes one day and then everyone took it off. COVID did not explode. I mean, it, that that in and of itself should have told us everything we need to know. But on planes now, as I'm sure you guys have both noticed, they always say, uh, you know, masking is no longer mandatory, but please respect the choices of the people sitting around you, which oddly they never said before, right? <laughs> when when they weren't, when they were forcing us, somehow choice was, was not relevant. Uh, but let's get cracking. Uh, Pfizer, since you both mentioned, or, or since you mentioned Pfizer there, Rob, they are still pushing out ads on vaccines and boosters uh, for not only uh, people, you know, let's say middle-age-ish, but for young people and pretty much everybody. And they've got celebs doing the hawking for them. Here's John Legend. Okay, I know I'm talking to every parent out there. Life with little kids can be a juggling act. Luna's got dance, Miles has basketball, plus they both have school and their own personalities. And now we've got a little baby in the house. But I wouldn't trade being a dad for anything in the world. I love being there for my special moments with my kids. That's why my health is such a priority to me and why I got an updated COVID-19 booster. My family did too. I encourage you to talk to your healthcare provider and go to vaccines.gov to check eligibility and schedule an appointment today. All right, a couple of things here. I don't know how much he got paid for that, but it was obviously a paid advertisement, even though it didn't look like an advertisement. It just looked like a, a selfie video in essence. Um, just on a personal note, uh, my partner, David, my husband, David, has COVID right now, as do our two, a six-month-old and a four-month-old. And we spoke to our pediatrician, and bas basically she said, uh, just keep giving them breast milk, a lot of love, a little fresh air when you can, make sure they're elevated a little bit. Uh, when sleeping, if possible, and then and they're already all on the mend. The idea that I would be injecting them with anything or would have injected them with this stuff beforehand is completely insane. Uh, Heather, it's just never going to stop, right? I mean, I think that's sort of what you're alluding to and what you're seeing in New York City, that these the ads, the behaviors, it, it seems like we've crossed some bizarre threshold here, even though Rob is saying, you know, some people are putting some of it behind, but the, the general movement of this thing seems like it's just going to keep going forever. Yes, the New York Times still publishes its weekly coronavirus update that purportedly shows hot spots in the country. There are none. You know, there's these little sort of cloudy dots here and there that have maybe like three people with COVID or five people in the hospital. Of course, we still are, are counting uh, hospitalizations with COVID as hospitalizations for COVID, same right. with the death rate. But yes, uh, there's a there's a core constituency committed to safetyism, it, it runs universities, uh, it's, it's highly female, and they are not willing to allow people to go back to a sense of individual risk calculation or governments to go to a sense of, of rational policy making that balances costs versus risk and, and, and celebrates uh, entrepreneurship and risk taking. Instead, we're all supposed to cower under the thumb of our government overseers. Yeah, Rob, I, I assume you see it in a somewhat similar light that even though you're seeing some degree of people moving past it, that, you know, especially for young people, that's the crazy thing. The 21 year old who's supposed to be a rebel, like, man, they are just asking for more and more. It's such a sad state of what of what human aging and, and the, the phases in life that you're supposed to go through are all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to respond to the John Legend thing, by the way. I mean, that was just absolute lunacy. I mean, I've been covering COVID, particularly vaccines and the approval and the development and the process in which they were uh, distributed to the public for over a year now. I mean, it's just been so egregious what's been happening that I've had to just focus there exclusively and sort of put 
previous right crime and race issues on the side. But, you know, this John Legend thing, it's like, you know, it, it makes no sense. He's like, you know, I, I love being a dad. I want to be there for my kids. I want to support my family. Therefore, I've gotten this highly experimental fifth <laughs> five-day <laughs> right. shot with no randomized clinical evidence, no evidence of how this is going to benefit me, no idea about adverse safety events. I mean, one CDC official, when asked about what the safety profile of the bivalent vaccine is, particularly the myocarditis issue, which disproportionately affects men uh, up until the age of 40, at least. Yep. Um, I, I've been writing about this at great length um, on my Substack because no one else will. Um, the CDC official said, uh, we don't know, but we accept we expect a similar safety profile for the myocarditis yep. issue, yep. similar. And if that's true, you mean you're compounding, you know, one in 2,000 or one in 3,000, you know, myocarditis risk over the first, second, third, fourth, fifth bivalent booster shot. I mean, they, they have no idea what they're doing. And so to like, like, this is just pure propaganda at this point on Twitter, this big celebrity, you know, moving from I love my family and want to protect them to get this uh highly experimental unproven pharmaceutical product where we don't know the benefits and we don't know the safety profile and it, it like it, it just makes no sense for anyone to get this thing unless they're you know highly highly sick and even then you know the, the case to make for getting the bivalent booster is difficult because we we don't really know how long this will last you know b best observational data is showing like two three months you know, my last, you'll be at 50% efficacy, but it's just so much uncertainty at this point. And you can see in that, that John Legend video, um, I saw it on Twitter a couple days ago. It was like 2 million views and like 100 likes. It's like no one's getting this thing either. I mean, last I checked, the, the bivalent booster uptake was something like 20 to 30%. And among like people under 40 to 50, it was like lower than that. Right, so, it's it's very, really incredible because because nobody's buying the not not nobody, but in the, the large majority of people, many of whom who don't really get it still, even they are not buying it. I had Dr. Robert Malone on uh, two weeks ago, who was you know owns more mRNA technology than anyone. I mean, he basically invented this thing, and what he said is that he thinks oh, no, he said I don't think it. He said I know it that the vaccine injuries are going to get much worse than what are being reported right now. Uh, and by the way, I have a I have a friend who's a young guy in his early 20s right now who, since he got vaccinated, has been having heart problems. And right now, for two weeks, he's in the midst of wearing a heart monitor so they can monitor him to figure out what's going on there. I mean, that's I know that's just one oh. one example, but it's like this is happening all over the country. But let's continue with with well, Pfizer. Me, and it, I, yeah, Heather, I, go ahead. You know, the, the fact that males are more susceptible to to setbacks and disease from this is a feature, not a bug. I mean, mm -hmm. we've seen how the vaccine policy previously was was put to equity ends and nothing is more equitable for society than getting rid of males because we know that they are the huh. source of all evils, particularly white males. And we saw vaccine policy you know, we're, we're some some jurisdictions not wanting to give a priority to elderly Americans who were the only ones really that had much to worry about from COVID because they're disproportionately white. So this whole COVID thing has been has a, an upside of being able to call populations that are that are less uh, uh, politically favored at this point. I would just say, Dave, and you know, I'm I'm not one to at all second guess Rob's research. But I do think that the anti-vaxxers are somewhat at risk of using the same uh, flawed thinking as the pro-vaxxing people now were before of seizing on single cases without mm -hmm. necessarily a randomized controlled experiment. So I, I, I fully I fully accept that. I'm, I'm giving just one example that happens to be in my life. I actually do have a couple other examples of young people that I know and, and people roughly my age that are having vaccine injuries balancing problems like uh, uh, shingles, like some weird, weird stuff. But I, I fully accept that. But you yeah. mentioned you mentioned the diversity, That's equity and inclusion part of this. Let me let me throw to this image, because uh, since John Legend is doing this for Pfizer, Pfizer, of course, also is big on DEI. And as you can see what it says right there, diversity, equity and inclusion, who we are. Everyone has something to offer. Diverse teams are more collaborative, more accepting of different perspectives and more representative of the world we share. Rav, nothing about uh, diverse teams being better at research and uh, maybe making sure that the vaccines work 
Am I just old school on this one? Yeah, yeah. I just want to quickly respond to something Heather said. Um, I, I'm absolutely concerned with a certain kind of anti-vax sentiment that you that you would see on the fringes of the right and the left and it, it, across the political spectrum. Um, you know, there are certain people who think millions of people are dying from the vaccine, and I think that's just ludicrous. And there's certain people on Twitter who every time someone dies, they're like, oh, it's the vaccine. People are <laughs> dropping dead from the vaccine. So that, that's absolutely a knee-jerk ideological response that I think is quite irrational. And I know I know many people who have fallen into that trap, but I always stick to the peer-reviewed evidence. And for the, the risk of heart inflammation, for example, about one in 3,000 for young males after the second dose, like that's absolutely alarming given the mm -hmm. incredibly low infection fatality rate. And the only reanalysis of the initial Pfizer and Moderna safety data done by Freeman and colleagues in peer the peer-reviewed journal Vaccine, top scientists from Stanford and UCLA, they found a serious adverse event rate of one in 800 um, from the initial clinical safety data and, well, and that's in comparison to all other vaccines that are about one per million or one per two million yep. for serious adverse event rates. So, you know, I, I stick to the evidence and according to the best evidence, there's a lot to worry about. And there are a lot of concerns that we're still trying to figure out um, with respect to the, the diversity, equity and inclusion stuff. I mean, you know, that's that's one great way to, to bolster confidence. I mean, now now not only. <laughs> Now, not only am I, am I considering and looking at a pharmaceutical uh, product that was heavily uh, financially incentivized and developed under Operation Warp Speed, um, which has its benefits, arguably, in, in an emergency situation for elderly people, but for younger people, the, the risk calculus is totally different. A product developed in rapid speed fashion, uh, no long-term data initially, the, the only initial trials, the endpoints of those trials was symptomatic infection, not severe disease. Most of the severe, severe disease data that we have is observational. And now on top of that, the people that were creating this, you know, perhaps, or, you know, however they're gonna uh, launch this DEI stuff for, for future doses. Now, now I also know the people behind this stuff are also going to be potentially selected based on skin color, right. based on immutable characteristics, rather than, you know, the, the, the best pharmaceutical and, and scientific researchers to create this product. Heather Shirley, a uh, lesbian, Latinx, black woman with a limp would be better suited to be making vaccines than a middle-aged white guy. <laughs> well, you know, science is about the scientific method and the absolute perversity of our current age is that we're making it all about scientists. It is it is the, the enlightenment triumph of elevating reason beyond the particularities and the trivialities of race and sex and gender, mm -hmm. which I, I hate to have just used that term because it's a complete fake uh, recent concoction. Uh, but, but now that's all that scientists are talking about. I can't tell you, Dave, every single day, uh, I've, I've got an oncologist who sends me the latest uh, racism is the heart of science message from Nature Magazine, from Scientific American, from JAMA, from his own uh, pediatric facility. Mm -hmm. It is an absolute obsession. And here's the key, Dave. Diversity is code word for racial preferences. At some yeah. point, you have to look at this and say the lady doth protest too much. Why do we keep talking and talking and talking about diversity? I can guarantee you if there was not a large academic skills gap, and this is very taboo to yep. mention, we have to swallow hard and realize we're talking about averages, not individuals. If there was not a large academic skills gap that is impeding uh, racial proportionality in, in institutions, nobody would be talking about diversity. The reason we talk mm -hmm. about diversity is it's a covert way to to import massive, massive racial preferences, which are threatening our competitive edge, threatening our scientific capacity, and will eventually put lives at risk. To dumb that down completely, I'm just not for discriminating against young Asian men who work very hard and try and do everything right. And I don't think Harvard nor any medical school or any 
uh, business should be discriminated against them, quite simply. But to really drive your point home, I saw this video yesterday. This is absolutely mind-blowing. So this is from Columbia University. This is Columbia University medical students chanting about critical race theory and a whole bunch more. Listen to the tone, the tenor of all of this, the repetitiveness, the droning of these clones. I mean, this is absolutely wild. Enjoy. We enter the profession of medicine with appreciation for the opportunity to build on the scientific and humanistic achievements of the past. We also recognize the acts and systems of oppression affected in the name of medicine. We take this oath of service to begin building a future grounded in truth, restoration, and equity to fulfill medicine's capacity to liberate. I promise to take care of my future patients by engaging in dialogue, listening to their lived experience, and tailoring my recommendations to their unique circumstances. I acknowledge the past and present failures of medicine to abide by its obligation to do no harm and affirm the need to address systemic issues in the institutions I uphold. I promise to critically examine the systems and experiences that impact every person's health and ability to receive care. I vow to use this knowledge to uplift my patients and disrupt the injustices that harm them as I forge the future of medicine. I promise to self-reflect diligently, to confront unconscious prejudices, and to develop the skills, knowledge, and character necessary to engender an inclusive, equitable field of medicine. And then they all drank the Kool-Aid and dropped dead. Um, Rav, I, I mean, I started scribbling down some of the things wrong that we heard there, but how about just the general tone of that? The, the, the lifeless tone with which the woman reads, that they read. Uh, these are supposed to be really bright young people who are gonna save lives. Equitable medicine? Sounds like you're gonna have to kill a certain set of people. I think Heather was basically alluding to that. Yeah, well, Dave, that just looked like a, like a pseudo-religious service. I mean, <laughs> it looked like a ceremony that these people are taking part in. It, you know, reminds me of like, you know, being little and watching like, like little kids at church having to like repeat something that they don't want. They don't want to be there. They're kind of bored. It's like, like these people, I don't know how many of them actually believe what they're saying. But the fact that they're being instructed to do these things when that's not really their role to examine unconscious biases, institutional corruption, racism. I mean, if you ask any doctor, they're overloaded with so much work to do. I mean, so much overwhelming data. And, you know, do I recommend a drug here or a behavioral intervention or whether it's exercise or sleep or medication or do this test or that test? And now they're also being told to reflect on institutional bias like it's completely out of their purview. And I don't know why they would start recommending doctors to do this kind of thing. Well, well they, Heather, they, I, think, I think you probably do know why, right? <laughs> yeah, it's because we are terrified of the ongoing racial skills gap and we now would rather blame our own institutions for phantom racism and say that standards are the problem rather than that lack of, of sufficient achievement uh, and we're tearing down our standards. We're tearing down gifted and talented programs. We're tearing down standardized tests. Some schools are getting rid of the medical school admissions test because they have a disparate impact. Uh, but, but here's the facts. Again, these are the things, Dave, that nobody wants to talk about, but you have 66% of black 12th graders not even possessing partial mastery of 12th grade math skills skills that are so basic they mean simply doing an arithmetical calculation or being able to understand a linear relationship on a graph. So, so we have that fact that nobody wants to look at. And then we say, well, if, if blacks are not 13% of Harvard medical students, it must be because Harvard is discriminating mm -hmm. in its medical admissions, which is complete a, a complete deception. There's not a single institution that is not according black privilege, not white privilege. No, I don't know of a single black student who's going around checking white on his <laughs> college admissions or, or, or graduate school or, or law school box. Right. But I do know of white students who are wanting to be underrepresented minorities. So, uh, but this thing, don't think this is just a bunch of idiot students. What, what this pledge was, this sort of land and race acknowledgement it sounds very much like materials coming out of the AMA, out of the American Association of Medical Colleges, which are going to start certifying colleges, medical schools based on 
whether they their faculty can repeat these bromides and whether they're teaching their students these bromides and it's all zero sum every moment a, a medical student spends learning about intersectionality which is a ridiculous idea is a moment spent not learning how to save you when you come into that emergency room after a car crash. Yeah, I think that's the key point, that once you bring this stuff in, you move your eyes off what the core competency of whatever the institution is. So ultimately you will over time have worse pilots, you will have worse doctors, you will have worse engineers, and we will wonder why people are dying of heart attacks and why bridges are collapsing and planes are crashing, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, as we were, as we were playing that video, uh, I said to my guys in studio, I was like, you know, guys, I'm never leaving Florida, and I forgot what video was coming up next. But we we are booting this stuff out of Florida right now. That is what DeSantis is doing this very week. Um, Joe Contreras, I'm with the Guardian newspaper and the Washington Monthly magazine. Among the areas you identify, that's like left of the left, right? <laughs> Can I ask my question? No, I know. I mean, you can, but I just, I, I've seen it. It's, uh, it's interesting. Why did it take you more than two years, Governor, to suddenly decide that DEI should be abolished in the state university system? Thank you. So it's a good question. So one, um, it wasn't at my direction. I didn't know what DEI was a couple years ago. Uh, as this had taken hold, I mean, it sounds innocuous, right? I thought maybe diversity of ideas, maybe actually have more than one viewpoint. Well, that's not what it is. Uh, what it is is it's trying to enforce a political agenda and a political orthodoxy under the auspices of administration. And, and that is something that, that is not in the best interest of this state. But I think if you look to see how it's worked in practice, um, it's been an embarrassment to see some of the things that have come out at Florida State, um, at some of these universities here. Uh, it's not an appropriate use of the administrative machinery of a university that, oh, by the way, subsists on the generosity of the taxpayers. We introduced legislation uh, to remedy that, and we will be the first state in these United States to wipe out DEI at our public universities. Heather, I thought there was a nice mea culpa there at the beginning by DeSantis when he said, you know, I didn't really know what this was a couple years ago. I thought that diversity meant diversity of ideas. Like this thing has crept up on many, many people, but you've really been writing about this for years and years. So you you must be sort of happy that people are coming around now and doing the right thing. Oh, you're way too generous to me, Dave. Actually, I'm furious that they haven't realized this. I feel like, where have you guys been? You know, I'm not the only one who's been. <laughs> right, I get that. I get that angle too. I get that angle. I feel that's with something sometimes. But, but the fact know, that he's going to do something about it—that's the point. Yeah, better late than never. And you know, the thing that is so disgusting about this, leaving aside the the overwhelmingly uh, biased and 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 fanciful portrayal of the United States that is the core of DEI ideology, the idea that we are systemically racist. Now, I'm not gonna deny the, the white supremacy and systemic racism of our past. It was horrible and we don't sufficiently account for it in conservative discourse, in my opinion. Nevertheless, that is not our reality today. But the other issue is just the sheer bureaucratic cost of these, of these initiatives. You mm -hmm. have bureaucrats up the wazoo that are the reason why tuition keeps going up and then you have the federal government saying, oh, well, we're going to take more taxpayer dollars from, you know, the people in East Palestine uh, mm -hmm. with their with their fuel spill that are working class so that we can spend more on college loans to prop up this whole corrupt, phony system of ever growing bureaucracies the bloatedness of these universities driven by the DEI bureaucracy, the whole thing is just absolutely nauseating and they get away with it and good for DeSantis for saying, you know what, there's something we can do about it and I'm not gonna be bludgeoned by the academic left. Rob, isn't that something when you hear a politician actually yeah. address a problem and then clearly do something about it? I mean, he's staffing right now colleges. Chris Rufo is here now helping out uh, you know, where they're going to get rid of DEI in some of the state schools, as as DeSantis referred to. Like, he's actually, he's not just saying it, he's actually doing something about it. Mm. I, I just want to quickly credit Heather for the work she's been doing for several years on mm. the, the, the racial skills gap. I mean, that's at the core of so many of these problems. And it's bizarre just how taboo that is. And I, yeah. I've written about this in Colette and the New York Post before. 
with respect to disparities in income between racial groups. Um, and, and even there, I've, I've gotten a lot of pushback for doing that thing, um, yep. for, for engaging in that kind of analysis. Um, but I, I just credit Heather for just continuing to to write about that stuff. It's uh, it's it, it, it's not written about enough. Um, the the difference in skills and education um, with respect to the stuff at, at universities. I mean, if you look at the budgets for some of these people working in DEI, you know, chief diversity officer, assistant, treasury, secretary of equity, blah, 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 blah. It's like hundreds of thousands of dollars per person or tens of thousands of dollars per person. At least I I think it was um, Mark Perry. I think he's at AEI and he's posted some graphs on Twitter, some charts showing how much these people are making. And it's just obscene. Like, wh like what are we doing with all this money? Like, imagine if we took all this money, like I think he was showing for one university it was something it was like hundreds of thousands of dollars for like five employees or something and it's like imagine if we could use that money and like help fund better education in inner city schools like help you know incentivize better programs for education and whatnot like like that would be a far better usage of resources but it, you know it's funny what, i've 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 never been able to find out how many uh young black people blm sent to college very bizarre. Yeah. You would think that number would be out there, but I'm fairly certain the number is zero. Let, let me just jump to one other thing with DeSantis related to all of this, which is that he's also now pushing a digital bill of rights. Obviously, uh, you know, between big tech censorship and algorithmic manipulation, all of the stuff that, that everybody watching this knows about. Uh, he's not waiting for the federal government to do anything on it because clearly they ain't going to do anything. So here is DeSantis, same press conference. So today we're going to be proposing and we're working with the legislature to, to enact uh, a digital bill of rights, uh, which will protect Floridians from big tech harms and big tech overreaches. Uh, also taking even stronger action to address threats posed by CCP related uh, um, uh, entities like TikTok, but not only TikTok, but doing it much broader than just state government devices. And so. What is the digital bill of rights? Well, uh, we want to protect your right as a Floridian to have private in-person conversations without big tech surveilling you. We also are going to protect the right uh, to participate in online platforms without unfair censorship. For, we want free speech. We want more speech, not less speech. We want to protect the right to know how these internet search engines are manipulating search results, transparency, in terms of what we're doing so that you can evaluate whether that's a search engine that you want to use or maybe you want to take your business elsewhere. Heather, is this federalism at its best? I mean, the feds don't seem to want to do anything. The administration, we actually know that they flag posts to silence people's free speech, individual people's free speech. So the states are going to do something, at least some of them. Yeah, if this is technically possible, this is way outside of my understanding. I don't know if it's, a state has the capacity, I'm not saying the lawful right, I would imagine it does, to make those changes into something as massive as these search platforms. But if it can be done, it's great. And I know Europe has been trying to get more uh, user privacy and control over personal information. So maybe there's, you know, things that, that uh, DeSantis can do, but, but it's certainly a great step. I mean, I noticed with that John Legend video for Pfizer, I wanted to see the comments and there was a sign there underneath it saying, <laughs> who can reply? People, Pfizer follows or monitors can reply. So yes. there are censoring there, which is just classic. Uh, but the worst censorship, of course, is for these tech companies to silence people who are not taking the correct line on lockdowns or outdoor mask wearing in the in the in the absurd idea that they are following the science and they're destroying misinformation. Well, you know better than anybody else, Dave, is our biggest free speech advocate, uh, that this is a complete misunderstanding of how the marketplace of ideas works and how truth emerges from conflict and argument, not from suppression. You know, the, the point you made on the comments being disabled or only people who follow Pfizer can comment, that, that's not nothing because it's happening now with almost everyone related to this. For example, Bill Gates, when he tweets, shuts off comments. Uh, mm -hmm. The head, Randy Weingarten, the head of the teachers union shuts off comments. Pfizer usually does. All of these people who we're told are our elite thought leaders who have, know so much better about how we should live our lives than we know for ourselves, uh, they don't want to hear from any of us. But mm -hmm. we ain't gonna stop, are we, Rob? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have a huge problem with people choosing to 
you, you know, turn off comments on their posts. But the, the larger issue on social media, which I've been reporting on for a year now, has been, you know, mainstream pro, like even pro vaccine scientists tweeting peer reviewed studies done by Ivy League, you know, scientists she is showing risk of adverse events on vaccines being labeled misleading or their mm -hmm. accounts censored. Uh, uh, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, obviously at Stanford, he's, he's a great guy. His account was blacklisted because he was on the wrong side of lockdowns. Um, you know, tweets being labeled misleading by, I think, Dr. Martin Kuldorf, the uh, co-signer of the, the Great Barrington Declaration, his tweet labeled misleading for saying that not everyone needs the vaccine. Like, th this is the level of censorship we've seen online this 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 very disturbing collusion between big tech the government the fda pfizer cdc all coming together as this collective entity that polices what is right and what isn't and deems one side as as safe and following the science and the other side which lumps in yes anti-vaxxers on the far right but also like scientists from stanford scientists from harvard yep. epidemiologists who had alternate perspectives on lockdown and on vaccine safety, for example, who were censored. But I'm glad Elon Musk has, has taken over and is reversing some of those things with uh, the Twitter files and with changing policy. What yeah, I find well, so amazing is, is the ignorance and naivete of the pro-censorship left, especially on campus. Uh, these students that want to ban speech under the banner of hate speech and the, and, you know, the underlying uh, conceit for all of this is the safety is conceit that that these wealthy, privileged students are just going around barely hanging on for their lives because they're so traumatic, traumatized and so oppressed. Uh, and so therefore, hate speech is going to just push them over the edge and they're all going to commit suicide or be killed. Um, but that they think that they will always control the reins of power in order to define what hate speech is. And they have no understanding of what one hopes is still neutral principles that were their ideological enemies to get hold of that power, they would use that censorship power against them. And so the only safe haven for this is to have complete viewpoint neutrality and let the sides duke it out. But when you start designating certain types of, of information as misinformation that you have the right to suppress, at some point, the tables will turn, one hopes, and uh, that same extraordinarily dangerous and violent power will be used against you. That's a great segue, actually, because speaking of, well, speaking of viewpoint uh, neutrality, so DeSantis comes in and he says, hey, we want to keep the internet, the promise of the internet, to be what we all thought 20 years ago, that you'd basically be able to get on here and say what you think, and we want to remove uh, from the schools, this indoctrination instead of uh, education, which is what ha what's happening with this AP African American Studies course that we've been covering all week, where they were also including gender queer theory and a whole bunch more. So listen to how the ladies at the View, and I always have to apologize to my audience before we play a clip from the View, but <laughs> here we go. Uh, listen to the, how the ladies of the View are describing what DeSantis is doing this week. <laughs> You know, Ron DeSantis went to Harvard and, and Yale. Yes, he did. So he's got a very good education. Now he doesn't want anybody else to have it, you know? Yeah. And that's famous, right? I mean, the, I, I took it seriously when Donald Trump said, I love the undereducated. The poorly educated. The poorly educated. Yeah, yeah. He said that specifically, and I think that Ron DeSantis is taking, you know, that page out of that playbook mm. because the less people know, the easier it is for those people to sort of gaslight them and, yeah. and snooker them. Yeah. And I think what's so offensive to me, and Whoopi, you kind of just alluded to it, is that he only targeted African-American yeah. AP yeah. studies. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Everything else was fair game. You could learn about Latinos, you could learn about Japanese, you could learn about Asian, everybody, but not black folks, <laughs> which are the very foundation of this country. Well, those are the ones, but that's the black... The black community in this country has suffered from slavery. That's why he doesn't well, want to talk about it. Well, we built this country for free. He doesn't, I know that. Are you telling me? Yeah. But, I mean, he doesn't want people to know that because it'll exactly. make white people feel bad. And we, and we want our reparations for it. And he doesn't well, that's want to pay. What
All right, putting aside that Joy looks drunk, um, everything Sunny said there was a lie. Every single word out of her mouth was a lie. She did not tell you what was going on in that African-American studies course. They refused to. They covered it every day this week. They refused to say anything about the gender theory stuff. And also, I don't know, are, are there uh, Afri AP courses in Asian American history? I don't know that it even exists. No. So it just, it's all complete nonsense. Heather, go first. I can see you're jumping at this one. Yeah, it's just, it's amazing. It is such a race hustle. Uh, I'm happy to be colorblind, but as long as this race hustle is one-sided, at some point people are gonna have to say, we're not putting up with this any longer. We refuse to be mau mau we we'll refuse to be guilt tripped. She's lying. There is not, the, this is the first AP course in a particular identity or race. It's mm -hmm. precisely because uh, we all go around so terrified of black anger uh, that we've created this course that is, it, it, were it not political, of course, African-American history is an extraordinarily important part of this history. I, I assume it's already being taught, but that of course be, it's already being taught. It's being taught in every high school in America, without right. question, without right. question. But what but, but, but made this course so completely unacceptable was its embrace of the most shallow, ignorant academic theorizing that has nothing to do with historical scholarship, which is simply the rote repetition of a particularly jargon-ridden academic discourse that is made out of air and whose only purpose is to keep white people feeling guilty so they keep shoveling benefits and destroying their own standards uh, in order to placate black rage. Rav, do you think that they actually believe what they're saying? You know, I'm getting tired of sort of, I always try to go out of my way to not impugn people's motives, but at some point, like, are they just complete idiots or liars, or is it like half and half? Like, do they really, do you think, have no idea? I know you're not inside their brains, but like, what do you think's really going on here? There is an executive producer of that show uh, who I'm gonna try to get on this show. Uh, I tweeted at him, I, obviously he's not gonna do it. Brian something, his name is. Can we, get me his name when you can. Um, but, you know, they're, they, and they, by the way, they, uh, we checked, they are part of ABC Entertainment, not ABC News. But what do you think is really going on there when they're doing this every day? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the way that that course was branded, right? I mean, AP African American Studies. I mean, oh, if you're if you're against that, then of course, I mean, aren't you against black people? Like, I mean, it's a very surface level, like reading where, where you, someone just doesn't have the brain power to actually look like, oh, you, this is not just black history. This is like they're teaching about intersectionality mm -hmm. in this course. That's not rigorous historical scholarship. I mean, that's a, a you know, made up theorized concoction within academia that that is far more pervasive than I thought, by the way. I mean, this stuff, a lot of people genuinely believe these things. I mean, I've had many, many encounters with people at my own university. I'm, I decided to go back to school, by the way, and I'm, I'm a, I'm a half-time uh, student there um, here locally. And it's like, Time and time again, I have these encounters. I mean, there, there was one professor a couple years ago, um, they were gonna uh, create some kind of club uh, or some kind of round table for students to come and talk about race issues. And one of the core elements of this round table was systemic racism. And I asked this professor whose name I'm, I'm escaping, she was also South Asian like me. And I said, hey, um, I, I don't exactly agree with the premise about the structural like racism. I think it's too simplistic. Well, am I still welcome at this table? And she was like, no, sorry, no, no, no. You got to accept <laughs> as this as the biblical foundational truth of Canadian history. Otherwise, you're not welcome here. And it's like, the, I wanted to make this point earlier about like Jordan Peterson, he's coming on campus or he's, he's coming to Vancouver on Tuesday and there mm -hmm. were talks about inviting him on campus. Um, one professor who's an old school liberal who actually disagrees with Peterson on many things and agrees with other things. He just tossed around the idea like, maybe we should invite him on campus, like uh, behind the scenes in, in a staff meeting. And the younger professors in the sociology and political science departments, obviously, said, well, we'll hold a protest if you're gonna invite Peterson on campus. So how dare you, how dare you even suggest that idea given how you know racist and transphobic and whatever Jordan Peterson is. And meanwhile, I'm having other encounters with philosophy professors in my classes who are saying like, Peterson's this like hardcore anti-intellectual who doesn't know how to read 
I mean, th this is the extent to which academia is just plagued by this DEI woke ideology. I mean, I, I thought that it would be far less pervasive than it's turned out to be in my case. And I'm just continually just troubled by this ideological monoculture where if, if you just step outside of it, if you just disagree a little bit, then suddenly you're um, a heretic. The idea that a professor, of course, everyone's allowed to protest, but the idea that a professor would be protesting because Jordan Peterson, the most, probably the most serious academic, certainly the most well-known academic we have in the world, who has brought more good ideas, uh, just the biblical stuff alone, back into the world, more than most religious scholars all combined in the last 50 years have done, and that they'd be wasting their time protesting on him is, is or protesting him is absolutely insane. By the way, the, the EP, the executive producer of The View, uh, I'll, I'll look at the camera. Brian Tedda, executive producer of The View, I would love to have you on the show. I will do it without notes. We can do it live whenever you wanna do it. We can air it during The View or after The View or before The View. And I'd like to talk to you about your journalistic integrity when you set up the show every day, what topics you give to the girls and what research goes into it, and whether you have any opinions on the fact that they share misinformation every day. So Brian Tedda, you are welcome on the Rubin Report at any point. And that's a good segue to our final clip, which of course is from The View and listen to the, the high level discourse on uh, what's going on here in Florida. You just saw Al Sharpton there. Yeah. I think that they, these people, these fascists out there like DeSantis, they think that we're just going to sit back and let them do whatever they want. No, we're not. We've, been, we've seen this movie before, okay? Those of us who lived in the 60s and 70s, yeah. we saw this movie. There, was many, there were many, many fascist tech, uh, tactics coming down the, the pike from Nixon and the rest of these fascists. That's what they are. And, and we protested and we protested and we ended a war that was illegal. Yeah. And we, we did stuff and it's happening again. That's the good news. But it's not happening, yeah. it's not happening enough in Florida. First off, uh, wait, I've said it many times, but I'm told that I live about five minutes away from Anna Navarro and I just cannot wait to meet this woman somewhere. Why is she living in this fascist state? Why doesn't she leave? I have no idea. But Heather, it's like, what the high hell is Joy talking about? What fascist takeover is Ron DeSantis doing? What war does Ron DeSantis want us to go to? All he's doing is pushing back. It really is that simple. I, I guess Bahar is like in some time warp. She doesn't look like it, but she seems to be maybe still a 14 year old. Her level of, of intellectual sophistication is, is, you know, that low. And these were the people who were complaining at the beginning of, of, of DeSantis not wanting people to be educated. Right, uh, right. I mean, the, the lack of knowledge of what fascism actually means, this is just absolute knee jerk smear. Now, I, I'm always asking myself, Dave, they would say the same about us. You know, mm -hmm. let's just be honest. They would say that we are just as knee jerk in our use of blanket epithets. Uh, and so I, I always sort of probe, like, do we do the same thing in, in calling them? I don't know. I mean, we call them totalitarianisms. They, they, they do want to shut down speech. Uh, one, one could debate that. I mean, one would need evidence on both sides. Sure. Let's just say in this case, though, uh, it's it's completely ludicrous. The idea that Nixon was a fascist. She's again, she's talking like the 60s. This was the the moment in the 60s when you had the rise of youth culture. You had a capitalist system that was so wildly successful that it gave teenagers spending power and power for the first time in all of human history. And it went downhill from there. You know, you had corporations creating youth culture and and these these idiots. We still have it ordering adults around, and she never grew up. She never gained some perspective of what actual threats of government power are. You know, Heather, I, I think you're making a great point about can we fall into that trap as well? And, and I'm not saying that we don't, and I call them silly names, especially on Twitter too, but I would say one, one clear distinction from people on the right and people on the left that I, that I see, almost not, obviously not exclusively, but fairly consistently, is that when something like the don't say gay bill the, the quote unquote, don't say gay bill, I'm using their language, that already proves it. When it happens, HB, I think it was 1447 or whatever it was, which had nothing to do with being gay and it was all about parental rights and education. On this show, I repeatedly explained what it was, said my position and then showed their position. 
My frustration with them is they never say what the thing is. They just use the, it's don't say gay, or they got rid of, as Rob said, you get rid of African-American studies. Well, who, AP African-American studies, you obviously are racist. They never explain the other thing. So I don't know that it's like, I don't think it's quite 50-50. I'm not saying you were saying that, but I think that is a substantive difference. Uh, Rob, uh, fascism, it's here apparently in Florida where everyone I know is happy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to quickly applaud like what's happening in Florida. I mean, the state journal, the state general, sorry, the surgeon general yesterday. Yeah, Dr. Ladipo. Ladipo sent a great letter to the FDA saying that more and more concerns about adverse events from the vaccine have risen, and you should seriously like consider what's going on here. I mean, Florida has led the way on COVID. It's just incredible um, how many people left and right um, have supported them in what they've done compared to blue states. Um, but th- th- this whole thing about language, I mean, what one often comes across this allegation of conspiracy theory on the right, which exists on the fringes, absolutely. You know, stolen election, anti-vax sentiment, you know, vaccines are killing millions of people, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of these ideas are completely deranged conspiracy theory, too. I mean, again, like th- this whole racial gap stuff that Heather and and I have written about, like Mm -hmm. every time there's a racial disparity, well, it must be racism, right? Right. If you're, if you're against this AP African American studies course, you're obviously racist. If you have questions about mRNA vaccines, you're obviously an anti-vaxxer, right? That's the definition of conspiracy theory, right? When you don't have evidence of a claim and you continually make that claim Mm -hmm. without Mm -hmm. adequate uh, evidence supporting your position, the, the left, you know, the far left continually does that to their oppo- their opponents and they, they continually just bend language and throw around allegations without any sufficient proof. You know, I would say, Dave, another aspect of our of our world, and, and that's a very interesting distinction that the that the right tries at least to lay out what the other side's argument is and the facts before getting into its own argument. The other thing that I've been going nuts with recently is who owns the default? Uh, It seems like no matter how radical and lunatic an idea that the left puts forward, it immediately becomes the default Mm -hmm. assumption. And to argue against it, you then have the burden of proof. So the, 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 you know, locus classicus of this is, of course, trans ideology that within a few years, all of a sudden, the default assumption in, in elite progressive circles, which are very, very wide circles, uh, is that, of course, uh, sex and gender are artificial constructs. There's something merely assigned at birth by an obstetrician, uh, and that children should have their noses rubbed into premature knowledge of sexuality. And I, you know, regardless of what kind of sexuality it is, I think that is child abuse to strip children of that innocence. But that now becomes the default. As somebody who does still subject yourself to the New York Times, I, I watch this all the time. <laughs> And it is those who argue against it that are seen as marginal. It's it's a very weird uh, and and incredibly important move that they're making because in law, uh, we know whoever has the burden of proof in a case, yes. they're up against a higher evidentiary standard. And so, you know, what law is all about is often burden shifting. You know, can you shift the burden onto the other side? And, and that's one of the things that we're up against when you can issue your challenge to the executive producer of The View, uh, but we're still the underdog here and, and he can ignore you. And the, the challenge is to get big enough and to control or, or have access to enough power in the media sphere and the information sphere that they do have to answer your challenge. Well, last month, we just found out this morning, I got an email from my guy, was our best month ever across every platform by 64%, not not 9%, not 16%, 64%. So maybe it's happening. Uh, by the way, the, what you're describing there, a lot of people call that factory settings, that sort of the, the factory settings of what we all come out of in the West is a sort of leftist indoctrination. And then the rest of us have to constantly be, be hatcheting away at that thing. Uh, Guys, I have thoroughly enjoyed this panel. I will gladly have you both back uh, anytime you want. Heather, thank you very much. Rob, thank you. We'll link to your stuff down below. I've got a post-game show coming up in about 42 seconds. We leave you with a cold close. Have a great weekend, everybody. Hello, Mom. Hello. 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 Thank you. Hello, Mom. Hello. 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 Hello